Marsh Davis, who is the president of Indiana Landmarks, cannot be here today. Um, some of you may know this person, some may not, but if you're in long-term preservation circles, you may be familiar with the name of J. Reed Williamson. Well, Reed died uh, this Sunday, September the 10th, and uh, he was a graduate of Yale University in 1956. He and Andy Houston were classmates, Ron. Uh, he was a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Uh, in 1966, he became the first executive director of the Historic Savannah Foundation, where he played a vital role in advocating, uh, excuse me, for the protection and preservation of the historic district against the then prevailing pro-demolition attitudes held by most of the city's leaders. He moved to Indianapolis in 1974, where for 31 years, he was president of Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana, now Indiana Landmarks, and the second largest historic preservation organization in the country after the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, Randall Shepard, the Chief Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court, former, summarized succinctly Reed's contributions. In the course of his outstanding career, Reed's contribution to that organization. Oh yeah, I, I apologize, I need to use my finger. In the course of his outstanding career, Reed Williamson nurtured Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana from a sapling, Ron, to a sapling to its current position as one of the tallest trees in the preservation forest. There's something about trees in this conference, I think, today, don't you think? So I would like to recognize Reed Williamson at this time. He was one of the greatest uh, individuals in the growth of the historic preservation movement uh, that has saved a lot of communities. And we uh, owe a, great debt, a debt of gratitude to Reed and all the good work that he has done. And if you'll fondly remember him in your prayers and his family. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we'll move on to the uh, Preservation Hero Award. And I quickly made notes. Ron, would you mind helping me with this? You're the beautiful model that will hold the prize. Right. Vanna White. Vanna White. Uh, the recipient of this year's Preservation Hero Award is Frank Walterman. Frank is deceased. He was born in Richmond and lived his life here. Like myself, he was raised in his family, excuse me, he was raised in his family's funeral home. He was reared in an environment of service to others. Both Frank and I chose funeral service as a profession. My father, when he was secretary of the State Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers, licensed Frank Walterman. That's another story that I have to tell sometime. My dad was a kidder. Later in life, following his father's footsteps again, he became mayor of Richmond. He was an innovator, not afraid to take risks and try new approaches. He made decisions that may not have been popular at the time, but paid dividends in the long run. He supported sustainability and even created an office of for energy, Lynn Johnstone. He was a prime mover to hold the Sure Conference, which I think was brought up earlier, the uh, Sustainable Urban Rural Enterprises, which Bob Kester and my cousin Ron were part of. He dedicated his life to service for the, to the community, and he cared for the common person. Frank is being recognized today about one of his unpopular decisions that has paid off big for our city. He received terrible criticism for buying the Pennsylvania, De the Pennsylvania Depot. He intervened when he learned the railroad filed a demolition permit 
to tear down this Daniel Burnham building. He turned over the building to the Urban Enterprise Association who held the building while those who cared worked to preserve this landmark until development could happen. Today, most folks are familiar with people like Roger Richard or Mark Brenton, but few remember uh, what people like Frank and others like Garrett Boone did in the early days to make this a reality. It has taken a generation to bring the depot to where it is today. Sometimes it takes a generation to bring something great to reality. I think Bob and I had a conversation once. Frank gave us a wonderful gift. I know that he is pleased with this legacy. Uh, this generation now owes Frank a great debt of gratitude. Um, uh, Frank was a great guy. I've known him ever since I was a kid and um, we're very lucky to have had him as mayor. And so I, I would like to ask Mary Merchant House, Mary Merchant House, thank you, Frank's widow, to come up and to receive our new Preservation Hero Award. In the past, I find a piece of junk from an old building that might have been torn down. I ru I've run out of junk. So now um, we have an artist in residence who is a photographer. So now our Preservation Hero Award now will be a photograph of a significant building in our community. And Mary, we would like to have you accept this as our gift in recognition for the great work that Frank has done for our community. And I hope you uh, will enjoy that for a long time. Thank you, Mary. Now, This brings us to another part of the presentation. 20 years ago, in one of my subversive actions, I asked Father Todd Reby to create a blessing for the depot. And this was, we had a little ceremony and it was, it was a nice little event. And I've had that prayer for a long time. I gave a copy of it to uh, Roger Richard. I've given a copy to the new owners uh, First Richmond Realty, but I think we need the voice of God to, uh, a voice like God, to perhaps recite this poem to be an inspiration for all of us. And this poem is in your packet for you to take home. You can apply it to your own community, I think. So, Ron? It was interesting to me that Every presentation today, in one form or another, asked that we not make assumptions about people's motivations, that we allow them to come to the right place and do the right thing from a variety of different perspectives and beliefs. So when uh, Matt showed me this prayer, I thought, well, what, whatever your religious conviction or motivation or whatever your belief or non-belief, the, what's said in this prayer reflects shared values that we could all get behind, whether we're uh, worshiping on Friday or Sunday or not at all. Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon this, our depot, and you can substitute any building you love uh, in any town you frequent for all the references here. In this special place, yesterday and today, the people of Richmond come together. As in past generations, so too today, we make this place a place of gathering, a place of welcome, a place of mingling, a place for families. From this place, earlier generations of citizens set off on life's journeys and our grandparents and great-grandparents made their way to this community. This place is a monument to our history, to our comings and our goings. The depot is a silent witness to the tears of mothers who sent their sons off to war and a monument to joyful reunions. 
In this place, families were, were reunited, and from this place, Richmond sent forth countless sons and daughters to make their mark on the world. Today, we gather in this historic place to rem remember that we are community, to remember that you call us together, to welcome one another, to share our lives, our joys, and our sorrows. You call us away from our isolation and our apathy to be a caring, welcoming community. As we ask your blessing on this depot, we ask that it may always be a reminder to us that you are with us in our journey and that you call us to come together, to come together as friends, as neighbors, as fellow citizens. May this depot be a catalyst in the rebirth of one of Richmond's great neighborhoods, a neighborhood long neglected. May the transformation of this historic building be a visible sign of the transformation of a neighborhood that has played such an important part in our city's history. May the North End be once again a place where families live and grow, where children run and play in safety, where neighbors know and support one another, where the joys and sorrows that are part of the journey of life are shared. As the depot was once the heart of our city, may it be today a place where hope and dreams are welcomed. May it be a place of new beginnings for our neighborhood and for our community. We ask your blessing on this place, on our city, our neighborhoods, and on our lives that we may offer this prayer in your most gracious name, amen. Uh, we've, had, we've had the uh, prayer blessing framed. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone from First Richmond Realty is here or from the Economic Development Corporation that would be able to take this. I'm, I know there was another, another obligation that they had. Uh, however, we will certainly make sure that uh, these folks will receive this and hopefully will display it with pride in a beautiful building that they now uh, are been, have been uh, steward to. I want to speak a little bit about Richmond Columbian properties. This shouldn't take too long. I wrote it down so I won't ramble. Uh, Richmond Columbian properties is an over organization over 100 years old. Its roots are connected with the Richmond Council number 580 Knights of Columbus as a real estate holding company owning the William G. Scott House for its use as the KFC Council Hall. When the Knights vacated the building, Richmond Columbian Properties took possession of the property, changing its mission and became a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Our mission is to be an advocate for neighborhood reinvestment, community redevelopment, and historic preservation. The hope is to build on the quality of the character and values that have made Richmond a great community. We do this by creating partnerships to share ideas and information that will find solutions to the challenges not only facing our city, but others as well. Groups we have worked with include uh, the City of Richmond, Richmond, Ur Richmond Urban Enterprise Association, Center City Development, Indiana Landmarks, Place Economics, Center for Community Progress, and Cincinnati Preservation Association. Margo, we love you. 
She's with the, that organization. Great lady. Along with several other groups and individuals who have helped us bring ideas and information to our forum. These are some of our projects. We developed a preservation plan for the William G. Scott House with Ball State University. When blight elimination became an issue, Richmond Columbian Properties facilitated a series of discussions to explore methods of blight elimination other than demolition. In the past, we sponsored lectures on history and preservation. We organized an annual Christmas tour of churches. We have assisted other nonprofits in allowing them to use our banquet facilities at no charge for their fundraising efforts. One example is the Richmond Symphony Orchestra and their spring fundraising event. Through the generosity of First Bank Richmond and the cooperation of the Richmond Art Museum, Richmond Columbian Properties has made the banquet room into an art gallery. We hold an annual photographic art exhibit and competition. Currently, the Richmond Art Museum is using our gallery to exhibit artwork during the renovation of its building. So we have a good collection of plein air art that you really need to look at. This summer, working with Wayne County Surveyor's Office, Richmond Columbian Properties developed an app for a walking tour map of the Star Historic District. This app can be developed as a tool to promote Richmond and all of its assets. Richmond Columbian Properties has led the way on preservation of three buildings along the historic 10th Street corridor. We were instrumental in raising the awareness of the Andrew Scott House and its decline. This was once in a historic house museum operated by the Wayne County Museum. Because they could no longer financially operate the building, they sold it to a couple who eventually abandoned the site and left it to the bank. Richmond Columbian Properties, along with Indiana Landmarks, monitored the situation and located a buyer, John Statzer, who has since restored the building. 211, 213, 215 North 10th Street, right across the street, became available through West End Bank. With a $10,000 loan from Indiana Landmarks, Richmond Columbian Properties purchased the houses and received a grant from the City of Richmond's Redevelopment Commission. One house has been rehabilitated, and both houses have been sold to a buyer who will live in one house and use the other as an office for their business. 231, 233 North 10th Street. This is a building that has been vacant for 20 years. Before that, it was neglected as a rental. Through the generosity of Wayne Bank, the building was donated to Indiana Landmarks. A grant again was given by Richmond Redevelopment Commission and the house is currently under restoration. Richmond Columbian Properties made the arrangements with Indiana Landmarks to make this save possible. Most important is the annual Quality of Place Conference that, brought, that has brought nationally and internationally known speakers to Richmond. These individuals have presented a wide range of topics focused on quality of place issues that communities face. It is our desire that any community may benefit from what our conference has, conference has to offer to help achieve Richmond Columbian Properties goals. We feel Richmond Columbian Properties serves a valuable role and looks forward to looking, looks forward to working with anyone who feels that sustainable communities are our global future. These are just some of the successes Richmond Columbian Properties has achieved. We plan to continue our mission of service in the tradition where our roots are connected with the Knights of Columbus and their ministry to their ministry to their community both locally and globally. Thank you. Carolyn Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Clemper. When I was a little girl, my sister and I liked to get up early in the morning and creep into our parents' bedroom and curl up on either side of our father. Now, my mother was not a morning person, and she would groan and roll over and put the pillow over her head 
But my father would tell us stories. And one of my favorite stories was about Peter and Anne and their adventures. And one day they were walking along a river. It was a beautiful sunny day. And trout were jumping out of the water. And they were singing a tune that went like this. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Well, Mother said that for weeks after that, as I was skipping down our gravel lane, if I wasn't singing zippity doo -dah, I was singing Peter and Anne. Now, jump ahead several years, our mother was driving a carload of us kids to Sunday school, and as usual, she had the station set on a classical music station. And this one particular day, they were saying, now we're going to play a piece by Schubert called the Trout Quintet. And they started playing bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, bum. And I thought, wait a minute, that's Peter and Ann. Only to say that the experiences we have as young children, positive and negative, can have a lasting effect on us and on the people we become. Since 1977, I have written 27 children's programs, taken them to all the Richmond schools each year, all across the country, and as far away as the former Soviet Union. These programs for many years I wrote for our string quartet, the Chanticleer String Quartet, as well as for a guest artist, be it a dancer or a mime, at one time even a magician, because I wanted the children to feel the magic in themselves. The last three programs I've written have been just presented by me for a group of only about 30 children because I want them to be able to interact. I want them to have the opportunity to ask questions and to be a part of the conversation. I want them to feel safe sharing their ideas and being a part of our little community during that hour. One of these shows is about emotions, and we end up talking about the emotion of anger, which everybody feels, and which can't be just stuffed in. We have to express it, but we talk about positive ways that you can express that anger. We talk about expressing that anger through music, through art, and of course, the children come up with many other ways that they can express their anger in positive ways. A second program that I do by myself with this small group of children is uh, about storytelling and helping the children realize that each one of them is a storyteller. Each one of them has a story to tell. And as we go through the program, they become more and more confident and they end up each one creating their own, his or her own story and making one of the characters of the story out of Play-Doh, and then presenting to the whole group what their story's about. Then, in the third program, which I do, is we take the children, I take the children to the middle 1700s, and we visit Mo Mozart in the city of Salzburg, and we speak German. And they go on a carriage ride with Mozart, and even have a, not flat tire, but a broken wheel. Well, they get very involved in the life of Mozart. And uh, we have period costumes, and the children play a half-size violin. And if there's a, a sullen young man in the back of the room, I'll invite him up to put on a crown and be the king for whom Mozart plays. My son, not knowing that I would be here today with you, happened to send me a quote that he saw on the wall outside of his son's music room. It was by Scott Peck, and it says, there can be no peace without community. I feel that the arts, in all their diversity and vitality and creativity, can help bring community and peace. If we're going to have strong leaders in our community, we need to encourage our children to think creatively, nonviolently, to trust themselves and be open-minded to other ways and other ideas. Now, Ali Acosta, a young violinist and student of mine, is going to uh, share some music with you, which she has been sharing throughout the community, in schools, in retirement homes, in church, and now with you. She's going to play Hunter's Chorus by Weber.
you so much for having me. My name is Eddie Kwan. I'm the director of My Cincinnati, which is a free daily youth orchestra program on the west side of Cincinnati. So as we get set up, a uh, quick show of hands, uh, apart from the wonderful musician that we just heard, did anyone else study music as a kid? Awesome. Anyone still playing music? Beautiful. So if you were like me, you probably had, uh, if you were lucky, a private teacher that you met with once a week for maybe 30 minutes, if you're even luckier, maybe an hour. And then the rest of the time, you were supposed to be practicing by yourself in your room. Uh, and if you were also like me, you found that extremely difficult. Uh, and that's not unreasonable, because especially if you're playing a stringed instrument or any kind of orchestral instrument, piano, whatever, it can be really hard to sound good when you're first starting. Uh, so staying encouraged as a young person when you're first starting your instrument is a huge challenge. It's why we lose so many young people in that first year of study. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about My Cincinnati and giving you an overview of the kind of programming that we do, our core values. Uh, but really, at, at the very center of this, we, we take the, the isolation of private study, we take the, uh, the aloneness of um, one way of learning an instrument out of, the, out of the picture. And immediately upon a child's first day of musical study, uh, they're in a group of their peers, they're with their friends, and they're part of a musical community. So those of you who don't know much about My Cincinnati, we are a completely tuition-free daily youth orchestra program on the west side of Cincinnati in a, in a community called Price Hill. Now, we were founded in 2011 by Laura Jekyll, my colleague who's with us today. And we started with just 11 students in the library of a public school. Now, we offered then violin, viola, and cello, and for two hours every single day after school, we had kids from several different neighborhood schools uh, come together and play in an orchestra. Now, we're just going to listen to a short clip of our very first video taken after five weeks of playing. So since 2011 uh, to 2017, we've grown from 11 students to 120. Uh, and all of these students meet for at least two hours every single day after school. Now, in our first year, we were at a school library. And every single day, we would go in, set up all of the music stands, push all the tables aside, set up all the chairs, which would take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. And then we would. Uh, have two hours of programming and then we would tear it all down and we did that for an entire year. Uh, so for those of you who are in arts organizations, you know that your space is so important uh, in helping to cultivate the kind of culture uh, that you want your program or your organization to have. Uh, so in our second year, we were able to move into our own space and now we are in a beautiful historic 100-year-old firehouse in the heart of our community. Uh, I'm just going to cycle through some really cute pictures of the kids as we, as we talk. Um, but My Cincinnati was founded uh, on a couple of core values. Uh, one being that access to high quality music education is a fundamental human right and not a privilege. Uh, second, that the very act of striving for musical and artistic excellence, through that act, a child can transform themselves and by extension, their family, their neighborhood, their city, and even an entire country. So in addition to our students, 
uh, that are age 5 through 18 who come from over 15 different schools within our neighborhood. Uh, we also have uh, many moms and parents that are playing alongside their children every single day, many of whom had never touched uh, a stringed instrument before. Um, now fast forward to 2015. Uh, here is uh, a summer camp concert conducted by the Cincinnati Pops conductor John Morris Russell. And many of the original 11 students are now playing in this advanced ensemble, playing a Shostakovich quartet. skip ahead to two years later in 2017 spring where we had a side-by-side -side concert with the Cincinnati Symphony uh, conducted by their assistant conductor and again Shostakovich this time the second movement of his eighth string quartet <laughs> So as you can see, even in just a short amount of time, the young musicians of my Cincinnati advance very quickly. Uh, and that is not an accident. When you're practicing at least two hours every single day uh, in a supportive, creative, exciting atmosphere, uh, amongst the guidance of master teaching artists, um, and you make it fun, it, it, there, there's really no stopping them. Um, but uh, I should repeat again, at its core, My Cincinnati is not a program that tries to create virtuoso musicians. Um, sometimes that happens just because uh, kids with a, a, a surprising amount of talent or uh, passion about an instrument will uh, be self-determined uh, and, and seek opportunities for advanced study themselves. Uh, but at the core, we are using music and the study of music within a community as a tool for youth development and community engagement. Now, one of the frameworks in which we view our work is this idea of music uh, as a vehicle for social action. Uh, now, what does this mean? Well, one of the programs that we started in 2014 uh, attempted to ask this question to some of our most advanced students and work together to find a couple of answers. Uh, this program is called the My Cincinnati Ambassador Ensemble Program. And the simple idea, well, the idea put simply, uh, was to combine an engagement and a critical examination of issues of social justice with collaborative music making and chamber music. So what that meant practically is that with a group of six advanced students, aged 12 through 15 that year, uh, I met with them every single week for two hours. And in those sessions, we had uh, intense critical discussions, workshops, and activities uh, that engaged with their questions and their experiences around identity, around race, gender, class, school, bullying, power, oppression. And we used our experiences and our skill set as musicians and artists as a lens in which to, to, to examine and, and to view these questions. So uh, after about three months of discussions, uh, there, there came to be some universal themes uh, and some common threads uh, throughout our conversations. And with the students, I worked uh, with them to create what ended up being about a 35-minute 
song cycle that weaved in and out of all of these stories and experiences and questions in a creative way. So I worked with them to create lyrics, uh, to write music, to create song structures, uh, to incorporate elements of performance art and different musical and world traditions into our performance. So I'm going to just share two excerpts with you. The first is called Snatch Me Up. And this song came out of a discussion we had uh, about uh, the young women in our group that experience catcalling or street harassment uh, on a daily basis. And so a lot of these questions came up uh, as to why this happens uh, and what, if anything, we can do about it. So this song is called Snatch Me Up. Shut up. The next excerpt I'm going to share is a song called Zayed's Story. Uh, this song stemmed out of a conversation uh, or a sharing of an experience that our double bass player Zayed expressed in one of our conversations. Uh, and Zayed was shopping at our uh, neighborhood Kroger, this Kroger where almost every single person in the neighborhood goes to almost on a daily basis. Um, and he was shopping for toothpaste and mouthwash. Uh, and was accused uh, falsely of shoplifting and was arrested and detained uh, at the Kroger. So this story examines uh, that experience and raises a couple questions. So it's summer and I'm 13. Tired and happy from working all day in the sun. I'm part of Safety Cat, a summer work program that organizes kids like me to clean up public spaces in Price Hill. We cut grass, pick up trash. It's a way to help the neighborhood and earn a little cash. But I'm finished for the day, so I head to the Kroger on Warsaw. I have 12 dollars and I need toothpaste and mouthwash so I'm at the store in the toothpaste aisle looking at way too many options Colgate Crest Arm and Hammer School Aquafresh Fluoride, fluoride free, baking soda, peroxide, tartar control, mint, spirit. 
your mint, mint free. Pro enamel, pro health, anti plaque, anti cavity, cavity protection, antibacterial, triple action, multi benefit, complete clean, extreme clean, max clean, SpongeBob, Squirt Pets, McDonald's, Burger King, Dairy Queen, Cream Soda, Tartar Control, Tartar Sauce, Fish Sticks, Applesauce, Apple Pie, McDonald's, Starburst, Skittles, Skittles. I can't decide, 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 I can't decide. I can't decide. So I'm pacing back and forth. It's what I do when I'm thinking. I pace back and forth. And this entire time, I feel eyes on me. Watching. It's the store manager, his sharp eyes locked on my body. I try to ignore it, but it is heavy. Back and forth. What did I do? Anyway, my breath is getting grimier and my teeth are getting fuzzier, so I finally make up my mind. Sense it out. And Listerine, a small bottle, so I can put it in my pocket. So I go to the self-checkout station, I scan, I pay, and I leave, sliding the toothpaste and mouthwash into my hoodie pocket. on the street when I hear Hey you, come here, get your hands behind your back. What did I do? What did I do? And there's the manager with the police arresting my black body. For what? taking too long to decide? For what? It's almost up right there. Thank you. So after finishing that year-long project uh, with these six incredible young musicians, uh, we were able to tour that entire performance work with the accompanying documentary in that following year where we visited Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, uh, Case Western Reserve University and their Social Justice Institute, uh, and a small art space in Columbus. Uh, that was a really special experience, I think, for a number of reasons. Uh, but particularly, the students were able to sit on college panels uh, and answer questions from undergraduate and graduate students about their perspectives on the intersection of social justice and the arts. Uh, so, our students were able to be the experts in that situation. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit more quickly on all of these. I know we're uh, a little crunched on time. So the next program I'm going to talk about at My Cincinnati is our Youth Apprentice Employment Program, which was piloted this past year. Uh, this program hired five current My Cincinnati high schoolers, including some of the ambassador ensemble. That's Zayed right there conducting the intermediate orchestra. We hired five high schoolers to take on various responsibilities in our daily programming. So that ranged from uh, become, uh, being a teaching artist, being a teaching assistant, helping with site coordination, uh, and all of the very, very small and thankless tasks that go into making a day successful. So this came out of a need that was expressed directly from our high schoolers. They were saying, you know, we love being an orchestra, we love coming to my Cincinnati, but I, I just got to get a job. I need to raise money, I need to save for college, uh, I need to focus on the future. 
so we developed this program in collaboration with uh, another nonprofit arts organization called Artworks in Cincinnati, and it was a, a overall a huge success. And so that program is expanding this coming year. Um, lastly, I'm going to touch on this idea, which is uh, using music and specifically collaborative performing arts as a tool to build a more inclusive and creative community. Now, what that means in practice uh, is our Price Hill Creative Community Festival that My Cincinnati hosts every summer. Now, this is a culmination of My Cincinnati's summer camp, uh, but it is a little bit more than that. Um, and what it is, this past summer was our second year doing this, uh, it is a, a two-day, completely free arts, music, uh, and com uh, community festival that's hosted by My Cincinnati. It's across four different venues within uh, one square block in, uh, in our neighborhood. And in addition to inviting some incredible local and national performing artists of many traditions to perform as part of the festival, um, we have uh, at its core uh, an artist in residence program. And this artist in residence program uh, is, uh, is an attempt to um, create uh, what we mean by uh, an, in, an inclusive community uh, in, in a, uh, in a uh, in a micro setting. So we, after an, uh, a national call for proposals, we selected five artisan residents that each created completely brand new collaborative performance work with the students of My Cincinnati. So that ranged from uh, an entire performance of protest music from all around the world, from different traditions, to a spoken word stage play, to um, uh, a high-tech installation that involved uh, lights and uh, colored light bulb sensitive stuff that I have no idea how it works. Um, and I'm going to cycle through some, some photos from the festival because it really was a, a special series of moments. Um, but at the core, uh, these artists in residence collaborative ensembles uh, were meant to sort of embody this inclusive spirit of the festival. And when we have an, uh, a, an ensemble, uh, that is made up of mo many, many generations uh, coming uh, with, with artists uh, coming from many, many different backgrounds that are working together to create something totally brand new. Uh, we felt that if we can do that in a, in a mini setting, that that kind of spirit can uh, radiate uh, and infuse uh, the, the rest of the community as well. So here is our firehouse, which is where the the festival headquarters and My Cincinnati's programming uh, is centered and where many of the performances happened. Um, one incredible uh, expansion of our programming has been our adult orchestra or what's been called, what's been newly minted as the Price Hill Harmonic. And that is a once a week adult orchestra made up of residents of the neighborhood. Uh, some of them are My Cincinnati parents, but a majority are not. Uh, and a vast majority are complete beginners. So they're learning an instrument um, for the very first time, and again, being part of this supportive uh, and creative community. Okay, that is it from me. Uh, if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to take them now, or we can just talk afterwards. But uh, again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck in all of your work. So, thank you. Well, that was fascinating. I was wondering, how is music going to fit together with everything else? Which is stupid, really, since I'm a composer. Um, and the answer is this. To perform a piece of music, you have to play together. That's the key. So it's a privilege for me, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand miles from here, to be with you today, learning and listening. And it's inspired me. We've learned about particular projects. We've learned about the state of America. We've learned about things in Europe. We've learned about uh, how to change a building, how to change a town, how to change a city. And I've learned a huge amount. Um, I've also learned that I came here knowing that to transform a place 
and to help it thrive into the future, you need to have some key qualities. You need to have a sense of place, who you are. You need to want to cherish it. You need to have the passion to protect the best of what you have. You need the energy and the desire to, to extend yourselves, to evolve, to go to new things. And you have to have a willingness to look outward for ideas. In my city of York, quite often we say the city walls, which we saw a photograph of, are brilliant at bringing people in, but they stop us from seeing anything outside. Um, I'm glad that you all look outwards. Um, I hope you've been as, as inspired as I have. It's also clear that you have all the tools here to be able to engage the wider community. From what I've heard, from the conversations I've had, from the very fact that this event has happened, from the fact that we heard about the great cultural events happening in Indianapolis. All these tools can help you uh, achieve what you want to achieve. But wait, a musical example. I studied African music at university, and I studied the Bambuti Pygmy music. And one feature of that music is that they use a hocketing style to sing, like bell ringers who each have one note. And if you want to hear a song, everyone has to be singing. You take one voice away, the melody is smaller. And that is key to what we need to do here, I would suggest to you. Matt and Ron took me yesterday to the parade. And it was a wonderful experience for me as a British person. I've never seen this. You see it regularly. It was new to me. I was delighted to see a community celebrating joyfully who you are and where you are. Harness all that energy, the energy and the voices of all the community, and you will create your sustainable future, and you will create a Richmond that thrives for many years to come. And I hope I'll be invited back to see it. Thank you to you all.